Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Brian Clayton, your favorite AO mentor, coming back at you this month with answering your questions and helping you guys with your small businesses and and uh, trying to help you guys avoid some mistakes maybe that I've made in the last 22 years. A, bit, a little bit of context about me for people who don't know who I am. Again, my name is Brian Clayton. I am CEO and co-founder of a company called GreenPal, which is a mobile app that works like Uber for lawn mowing services nationwide, United States, with a few hundred thousand people using it. Built that uh, for the last 10 years, and before that, I had a landscaping business that I grew to about 125 people, um, and it was acquired by a national company after about 15 years of running that. So 22 years, two businesses, both of them over eight figures and so uh blue collar one was a tech business and so i can kind of see a lot of uh, small business problems from both sides of the table i guess you could say and so hopefully uh i can add some value to you guys today let's get into it let's see the first question uh kimberly benjamin can you sell an idea on how to make an existing product better i sell life insurance when i am slow at the salon we have an app that we use and I feel like there are ways to improve the app to help customer experience. I wanted to know how to pitch an idea and sell it at the same time. If you wanted to pitch this idea of the company to that company, how would you take it? I think I answered this question last month, but I'll go ahead and answer it again. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, ideas are worth about $5. The When it comes to business, <coughs> business is kind of like going to the gym. You get... Uh, you get paid for the work you do in the gym. You get paid for waking up early, doing the make you know, doing a 5K run, uh, staying on a regimented program in the gym, uh, and actually doing the work. You don't get paid for uh, I, you know, figuring out the best idea around what uh, what workout you might do or what diet you might do. Uh, you only get the results for the stuff that gets done in the gym. Business is exactly like that. The ideas are pretty much worthless. You can't sell them. Um, if you're interested in helping that company, you might you might just offer them some free advice as a customer. Say, hey, look, I've got this idea, you know, and and just e you know, email the CEO or 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 or, or just uh, cold uh, message them on LinkedIn or something, and it may turn into something. But pitching them on the idea of selling them uh, some some consulting services or something like that is a dead end. I wouldn't waste my time with that. Next question, Ricardo Delgado. How does a business analyze where they start improving and scaling? In simpler, ter in simpler terms, how does a $100,000 business differ from a million-dollar business and what mindset and traits are involved? Great question. I own a barber shop, and I am as a barber. I am a barber as well. How can I start analyzing where to start making more revenue and take action right away? So uh, it's a great question because... Business is like a video game. Uh, you, you, you get 10 levels of Super Mario Brothers, and you just work one level at a time. Uh, you don't worry about levels 7, 8, and 9 when you're on levels 1, 2, or 3. So metaphorically, uh, if, if your business is doing $100,000 a year, it's, it's, it's maybe like levels 1, 2, or 3. And uh, a, a barber shop with multiple locations doing a million, five million, ten million dollars a year is more like levels seven, eight, and nine. So your question is very smart because you don't want to waste time on Bowser-related problems when you're really on just level one. So that's the first thing. Uh, how do you figure out what level of the game you're at? You know, if you're doing a hundred k, you're you're probably more in the in the earlier levels. And so. Um, the, the the trick there is 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 to focus on things that that uh, get you out of in the business to on the business and so a great book about that is the E Myth by Michael Gerber and if you're doing a hundred thousand dollars a year you said you're a barber yourself um, how do you how do you transition from in the business to on the business you're probably working fifty sixty hours a week in the business and ve probably very little time on the business and so. Some of the on the business things might be what is your marketing strategy? What is your social media marketing strategy? In the in the in the in the hair care industry, I imagine that's probably huge. And it's not just I post here and there. No, what is the routine? What is the process? 
what is the uh, employee training strategy? What's the customer satisfaction strategy? What is the uh, what what is the uh, competitive analysis strategy? Like, uh, how do I figure out if I'm losing customers to, to competitors? What is the, the 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 IT strategy in terms of of uh, how do I how do I have the best CRM for barbers so I know when to reach out to them to get them to come back and make sure they're happy at the exact right time? Um, these are like six seven things, and you could probably f pick one of them and start working on one of them uh, today and uh, and to make your business better. Uh, and almost in a weird way, it doesn't matter which one you pick. Like zoom in on one piece of the business and figure out a way to make it better in terms of systemizing it, working on it, not just cutting hair, not just ringing somebody up at the cash register, not just paying taxes and paying bills, like literally working on this process. What is the best training system that I can put in place where when my customers come into my barbershop, they get a consistent experience. Uh, uh, that, that, that you don't get somewhere else. And like when I mean I sit down, I'm offered a beer or a whiskey or a Coke. I'm given a hot towel. Um, the person washes my hair before they cut. Uh, they, they, they do it the same way every single time. It's a consistent experience that, that other barbershops aren't giving. And this employee training system is the thing that delivers that consistent experience. If you would spend like two or three months on that system, and then move on to the next system. Okay, well what is the customer satisfaction system? Okay, how do I make sure my customers are happy? And how do I make sure I'm reaching out to them? And what is the CRM that I'm going to put in place? And so these are the things that you can do as, as in levels one, two, or three uh, to get to level seven, eight, and nine. Um, and, and just pick one facet of the business and make it as good as it can be and then move on to the next. That's what I would do. Um, the third thing is work on yourself. You work in the business, you work on the business, and then you work on yourself. What are the books you're reading? You know, have you read The E-Myth? Have you read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey? There's actually an example about a barbershop in that book. Um, have you read, uh, have, have, have you taken online courses around small business marketing and social media marketing? You know, are you working on yourself so you level up? Because every business reaches a choke point of what the founders capabilities are um, if you don't know decent copywriting if you don't know how to run a Facebook campaign if you don't know what your Instagram uh, marketing looks like then the business is going to reach that that uh, choke point so you have to learn these things for me you know when I've started from scratch uh, two times in the last 20 years Sunday was the best day that I always worked on myself I always carved out four or five hours to take an online class read a book listen to an audio book, listen to podcasts, things of that sort. And a lot of times it's block and tackling for whatever stage of the game you're at. So let's say you, you wanted to take my advice and, and do the example on working on your employee training system. Well, then there's online classes for that. There's, there's blogs about that. There's, there's SaaS products that serve that kind of training niche, and they have free content that you can, you can learn from. Uh, that's, that is what I would do if, if I was uh, in your shoes. Hope that helps. Good luck. Great question. Next question is from Cliff Pollard. When looking to get on social media to start creating content, should my focus be on my personal profile or my company's profile? I am starting on Instagram first and I need to know need to be the face of my company, but I'm struggling with what profile I should focus on. Personal profile talking about my business or my business page featuring me as a brand. I would do the latter. I don't think it matters a whole lot because um, the content is what's going to be driving the conversions. So whatever the content is, um, it would be helpful to know what kind of business you're in so I could give you an example. But let's say let's say uh, you were the, the, the you were uh, Ricardo with the previous question about the barbershop. And you want to start driving some eyeballs, some interest, some traffic via Instagram and Facebook and and uh, TikTok. The person viewing the content doesn't care if it's Cliff Pollard or Cliff Pollard's barbershop. They don't really care. What they care about is what is the content? Is it beautiful before and afters? Is is it tips about how to use the best styling product? Is it 
uh, if if you're dealing with uh, hair loss, is it tips on how to how to help with hair loss? Is it tips on on skin care? Like, is the content really helpful and good? That's what I would focus on. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about if it's me personally or my company. But if I had to pick one, I would create my personal brand, and that would just be my personal life. And then my company would be my company profile is what I would throw 100% of my time in. And that would be me creating the content and and being the face of that. And then as time goes on, maybe you can hand that off to another social media person inside the company and they can take over the reins. Uh, whereas if it was your personal account, it'd be hard to make that transition. Great question. Good luck with it. Next question from David Monj. Do you think 35 years is too late to transition careers? I am a mortgage loan originator, and due to rising rates, it's become difficult to close three loans a month. I have decided to pick up a trade skill, and I am looking at construction, electrician, or commercial plumbing. But being that I'm 35 years old, uh, is it too late to get into a new trade? I inquired about a job opening in the trades. You all want minimum a year experience. I want to take a pay cut to become an apprentice. What are your thoughts? I've been doing mortgages in the last four years, and I've been in sales for six in Arkansas, currently seeking a career change due to the real estate market. It's an important question because I think we're going to start having a reversion of people going back to blue-collar jobs. There's a shortage of plumbers, HVAC techs, um, tradesmen and construction and and I th and 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 those those jobs are actually paying more uh than than most white collar jobs uh, so we we've seen that in the last 10 to 20 years and I think as uh you know the younger generations don't necess aren't necessarily drawn to those types of vocations so I I think I think there's an opportunity to to go pursue that type of work um and not just as a technician but like to create your own business in that trade. So let's say you wanted to uh, become an electrician, you know, spend two, two or three years learning how to become a good technician and then observe and create your own business plan on how you would create the best electrician repair business or installation business. That could be a two to three to a five year journey. I think if you're willing to start from the bottom, I think somebody would hire you if you're a hard worker. Um, and, and you wanted to be an assistant or something like that, I, I think if you were tenacious or, uh, enough about getting a, getting a job in, in one of these trades, you could easily get one because, because I mean, these types of, of blue-collar uh, businesses are always looking for help. So I, I don't think that's going to be a roadblock for you. The question around is 35 years old, too late to start over. I don't think so. I think 35 is still young. I'm 43. Um, and I, you know, heaven forbid, if I had to start over tomorrow, I, I, th I think I could do it. So I don't think that's too too old, to be honest. Um, especially if you had like a ten year plan to say, okay, in ten years, I'm going to have an electrician business with ten employees. And what does every single year look like to get there? Well, the first year is I got I got to get out of the mortgage business because I think it's a dead end. Uh, th this is just me paraphrasing what you said. Um, and so um, that's year one. By the end of year one, I want to have a job at a great electrician company, and I want to start learning how to become an electrician. So that the first year, if I did that, that's a success. And the second year would be, okay, I'm now a, a master tradesman uh, in the electric business. I'm, I'm making $55 an hour or $45 an hour or $35 an hour. I'm the best tech at my business that, that hired me. Because I, because I literally just work circles around everybody else, and uh, I've learned everything there is to learn about how to execute electrician services. Now I'm reading books on how to start my own electrician business, and I'm reading books like the E Myth. I'm, I'm observing what gaps there are in the marketplace. What is it that that the company I work for is not doing so well that I could do well? So I, I have a rough business plan in the in the year two. Year three is okay. I've saved up. Uh, $50,000 because I'm going to need that or $100,000 uh, to, to start my own electrician business. It's going to be me. I'm going to be a one-man paper hanger. I'm going to be uh, answering phone calls, doing service calls, installing all that stuff myself. 
and by the end of year three, I'm going to be in business for myself. End of year four is big moment. I'm going to have hired my first employee, and I'm going to figure out how much I can pay them, how much I can bill customers to recover that money, and what my labor hours are, and and all that. Okay, so that's year four. Year five is I have three employees. Year six is now I have five employees. And you can see by the end of 10 years, you could have a, a good business doing, you know, a million, two million, three million dollars a year in, in revenue, and you'll be 45 years old, which is still young, and you'll have a profitable business under your belt. So, no, I don't think it's too late. I think it's a good idea to be looking at some of these blue collar vocations as a place to start businesses because I think if you can bring kind of a younger mindset especially around technology uh, to those types of traditional businesses I think I think you could really spank the pants off your competition who's been doing it for 20 or 30 years the same way next question from Kimberly Benjamin what is the best way to launch a new product and get a lot of people talking about it I'm a go-getter at heart all day hustling uh, team no sleep as I sit here and I think about ways to educate people about my product while getting them to buy at the same time. I know there has to be a faster way to go from salon to salon, hair show, hair, sh hair show to hair show, and I am open to any suggestions that will give me momentum. I need to help scale the business as fast as possible. Okay, so I'm assuming, uh, I believe you asked a question beforehand. Let's see. Yeah, that you asked the first question. Okay, so how do you go about getting uh, people to to talk about your your new your new product? Okay, I'm assuming it's something in the hair hair care space. And what you learn is when starting a new product, selling a new business, you know, starting a new business, you you start to realize that. In some, 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 some aspects, like creating a new product and selling a new product, it's actually harder to market the product than it was creating the product in a weird way. So th th it's more challenging to get eyeballs and, and people talking about the product and trying the product and awareness around the product than it is to create the product itself. This is why, you know, in today's world, you know, Kim Kardashian is so valuable because she has distribution and she has awareness around uh, uh, you know she has eyeballs and so she can bring a product to market and um, and if it's good make it an instant success because she already has that distribution in place this is why she's a billionaire this is why you know celebrities nowadays like rihanna are, are billionaires because uh, and jay-z because they can they have the awareness around them whether it be social media or traditional tradi traditional media um to to distribute and move a product and so, and so the problem you're tackling is, is a hard one. Now, you say you're a hustler. That's great because you're going to need it. Uh, you talk about trade shows, going from trade shows to trade shows. That's exactly what you need to be doing. Hand-to-hand -hand combat style, getting your first 1,000 customers by hand. It's hard to scale something that you haven't hand-cranked yourself. So my advice would be get your first 1,000 orders literally by hand, uh, going to trade shows. Uh, selling them out of the salon, um, maybe you know, selling them via social media, doing Instagram lives and, and, and talking about the product and how it can help people and change their lives and taking orders that way. Do your first thousand orders by hand, and then you'll figure out ways to scale by doing that. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying, nail it, then scale it. If you, if you haven't, like, hand-cranked a couple hundred orders or a thousand orders, there's no way to know what to do to scale, what works. And so that's what I would do. I would, I would by uh, any means necessary, hand-to-hand -hand combat, trade shows, uh, going online on, on Instagram Live, TikTok, um, and, and trying to talk to customers, uh, pitching them on how the product can help them, and taking orders by hand. And then you'll know, okay, yeah, this is my, this is my customer segment. This is where they hang out. I can reach them, you know, with a Shopify store or, or on Amazon or, or whatever, but you can't skip all of that until you've hand-cranked the first several hundred orders yourself. Uh, next question, also by Kimberly Benjamin. Is it okay to do a pre-launch pre, uh, or pre-orders without it, without in hand? I'm, uh, let's see, I'm a hairstylist. I have a product that I am working on, and I was wondering, is it okay to do a virtual soft launch? We are in the 
rendering phase of my product. So I'm just, I just want to know how okay it is to start talking about it and creating a buzz without having, uh, without everyone anticipating for it to come out while collecting enough capital dedicated for the product as it comes out. Okay, so I'm assuming you're saying, okay, I, I have this product. Let's just say it's the best uh, color or straightener or whatever, and uh, it's in production, and uh, I want to take pre-orders for it. I, I don't see think that's a problem, um, just so long as you know you can deliver, and I wouldn't take more pre-orders than I knew I could deliver. So I imagine if somebody's going to trust you enough to to order this product without it, you do, without you having it in hand, these are really good customer relationships. I imagine for your salon, and you don't want to ruin those with you know a fifty dollar product sale. So I would do that because, like we talked about in the previous question, just going through the reps of taking those orders and and uh, and uh, and talking to customers about what they want, what they like about the product, and what they don't, will will give you learnings on how you can th then scale. So. The, the my my answer is yes I would do that but I but I wouldn't get too far ahead of my skis to where uh, I I was not able to deliver um, is how I is how I would approach that maybe maybe 50 orders 100 orders might be good um, and that gets you kind of like maybe on first base for when the product does drop from your supplier you can then hit the ground running rather than sitting on all this inventory and having to go through all that work anyways also you know trying to sell it pre-order style to 20, 30, or 40, or 50 people, you will learn so much more doing that than you will a year of planning. Uh, you'll learn about what people's objections are, what they're looking for, uh, how sensitive they are to your pricing. You know, they might, you know, $10 too cheap, $200 too expensive, whatever. You'll learn more doing those pre-orders. Um, and so it's probably less about the money you're going to make on the pre-order and the learning you're going to get about who your customer is and what they're looking for is is what you're going to get out of that last question from stella nezechik sorry if i mispronounced your last name how do i inform customers about price increases and do i even have to do it i am an active wear brand for women and i am considering a slight increase of prices on the products we sell mostly leggings Sean mentioned somewhere that a slight increase of 8% yearly is standard and usually accepted well by customers. I am trying to figure out how to communicate that with my existing customers and followers of social media. Some customers might complain. How do I handle this? It's a good question. The way I like to approach uh, pricing is, is from a bottoms-up approach. And what I mean by that is, okay, where do I sit in the competitive landscape of, of what my customers can buy? You know, what, like, where do I sit if it's leggings? Okay, where do I sit against Lululemon, uh, against Viore, against uh, the other, maybe two or three other do dominant names in, in, uh, in the market? And what do I do better than them? What is my value proposition? If I'm your ideal customer, meaning I'm a woman between the ages of 20 and 45, I'm just guessing, why would I buy your leggings over Lululemon or anybody else? And the answer is always because. Because we use this proprietary fabric that doesn't tear or because your butt looks better or because you, you feel more comfortable, whatever it is, it's always an answer. And so, so that is important to know before you start talking about pricing because if the answer to that question is because we are cheaper we're cheaper than, than Lululemon, or we're more expensive, but we're a better product. You need to know what that answer is because that, that informs what pricing can be. So if it's cheaper, then, then my pricing might be, okay, well, Lululemon is $150 for a pair of leggings. We're $78, uh, and, and there's still a gap there, so we feel like we can raise prices 5 or 10% and be okay. Uh, but if it's yeah, Lululemon's 155 and we're 148. Well, <laughs> you're going to raise prices, be directly competing with Lululemon. You're going to probably notice a drop in sales because your value proposition is not not so much str not 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 strong in that sense. Uh, so that's where I would start. I would start from a bottoms up. Where do I sit in the marketplace? What are my competitors pricing at? Uh, not necessarily. Hey, my costs are going up, so I have to increase prices to you guys. Your customer doesn't care if your costs are going up. And yeah, Sean's right. You can you can increase costs uh, on a yearly basis and probably be okay. But I would rather go through the exercise and say, okay, where do I sit in the competitive landscape? 
where am I priced against my competitors? And am I a premium product? Am I a discount product? And let that inform uh, uh, how I price my product accordingly. Because your customer doesn't care if your costs are going up. They only care if you can give them the best uh, solution at the best price. Um, and then I would also test around that. Maybe don't just do 8% across the board. Maybe maybe test uh, one state. Maybe just test California. And and if you start noticing a nosedive in, in sales, well, then you haven't made the mistake of, of doing it across the board. Um, is so I would test and then invest. I would test it first and then start raising prices everywhere else. Hope that helps. Uh, great questions this month, guys and gals. I had a lot of fun. I will see you guys next month and y'all keep grinding on your businesses and good luck with everything and feel free to ping me or reach out to me on instagram uh brian m clayton you can drop me a dm there and i'll talk to you guys again soon bye bye